Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are, wherever you're logging in from. And welcome to the fourth in the 2023-2024 African Literature Association lecture series. All right. Um, I am sitting here at my uh, dining room table in Charleston, South Carolina. My name is Simon Lewis. I'm on the ALA Executive Council, and I'm the person charged with coordinating these lectures. I'd like to take just a minute or so to explain uh, the setup here. Our guest lecturer, uh, Professor Nduka Otiono, and our moderator, Professor Dorothy Odarty Wellington are here on Zoom with me and with our web whiz, uh, Lexi Langendorf, while you are all watching via the ALA YouTube site. Uh, so please, for a start, if you're willing and able, uh, please do post on the ALA YouTube site in the chat where you're logging in from, and continue to post comments and questions whenever they occur to you during uh, Dr. Otiono's uh, presentation. Lexi and I will be moderating the chat on YouTube and, and feeding the questions and comments to Professor Odarty Wellington for the discussion that will follow the lecture. So those are the uh, technical arrangements. Let me now very briefly introduce our moderator for today's lecture, uh, Dorothy Odarty Wellington. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Odarty Wellington is an associate professor in the School of Languages and Literatures at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada, where she teaches Afro-Hispanic literature, contemporary Spanish literature, and particularly opposite to today's lecture, narratives of migration. Professor Odarty Wellington has her BA from the University of Ghana and her MA and PhD from McGill University in Canada. She's a member of the ALA's Executive Council and currently serves as the EC's caucus liaison. Among her publications are an edited volume of Afro-Hispanic literature and a monograph on contemporary Spanish fiction. She's also published several journal articles and book chapters on Afro-Hispanic literatures and cultures from Equatorial Guinea and Western Sahara. And her recent research has focused on the representations of Sahrawi identity in exile. So welcome to you, Dorothy. Thank you very much for being our moderator today. And I will now hand uh, the procedure over to you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Simon. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, I'm so delighted uh, for this opportunity to introduce our guest uh, speaker today and to moderate the event uh, for many reasons. But one of, uh, of, of these reasons is that it is not every day that I meet a Canadian colleague at ALA <laughs> events, let alone have the honor of introducing them. Uh, Professor Induko Tiono joins us today from Carleton University, Canada, where he is Associate Professor of um, African Studies. Now, the list of uh, Professor Tiono's publications that uh, we have in the short biography on the poster for this event um, telegraphs his illustrious career, not only as an academic, but also as a pra practitioner of African creative expression. And my challenge here is to do justice to the multifaceted aspect of Professor Tiono's career, um, which span not only scholarship and creative writing, but also journalism and administration. Now, records indicate that Professor Tiano, or Tiono began writing as an undergraduate student. And indeed, some of the short stories in his, uh, in his collection, The Night Hides with, with a Knife, may belong to that early era. Chris Danton, who has described Nigeria as, quote, the powerhouse of contemporary African literature, described the night heights with a knife as, quote, an outstanding product 
from that powerhouse in his review of a recent edition of the book. You can find the key to Danton's appreciation of the work in one of the many stories such as Wings of Rebellion, which begins, quote, ah, Induka, I know those lines. They are from Ni, ni Oshundari's um, waiting laughters, and I'm sure you've chosen them to remind me again of the tale, that tale you've been bothering me to tell you, end quote. As I tried to find which of Professor Tiono's recent works to read, I settled on the collection of poems displaced the poetry of Induka Otiono. The book won the African Literature Association Book of the Year Award for Creative Writing and was also a finalist for Archibald Lampman Award for, for the Archibald Lampman Award for Poetry. But it was a phrase in the editor's foreword that prompted me to pick up that book. It said, quote, the volume that you hold in your hand sizzles. So I randomly selected the poem, High Walls and Barbed Wire. I read uh, the last, up to the last verse and dropped the book. Remember, it sizzles. But it also stings like barbed wire. Who better then than Professor Tiono to speak to us today having brought to our libraries, to our homes and to our hands and hearts, poems and short stories from every corner of Nigeria through his anthologies. I just cite for your convenience, one of them, Camouflage, whose second edition came out in 2021. And what a fine selection of writing from a diverse crop of writers. Pick it up and read any one of the stories, be it Omale, Omale, um Alan Abdul Jabez's devastatingly painful story, I Bought My Own Coffin, or Simeon Chibiko um, side splitting the senator's coffin. You will not be disappointed. Professor Tiono worked for many years as a journalist in Nigeria. And in other words, I'd say that Professor Tiono has been telling stories all his adult life in one way or another. He points out in an interview that one of his first major stories as a journalist covered the largest open air electronics market in Africa. And reading his work and his anthologies, I can appreciate the point that he makes in that interview that for him, the streets of, Af the streets of African cities are like theaters. Those urban theaters and Professor Tiono's background as a journalist also inform his extensive scholarly research, which focuses on urban narratives in Africa and their movement across multiple media, including films, popular music, and social media. Furthermore, he explores the political rev relevance of those narratives and the ways in which they confront power. You'll find Professor Tiono's diverse scholarly output with topics from several fields, including um, cultural studies, orature, post-colonial studies, communication studies, and many more in such prestigious venues as Journal of Folklore Research, African Literature Today, Journal of African Cinema, Wasafiri, and other, other venues. His most recent co-edited book of, um, his most recent uh, co-edited book, Africa Liter African Literatures in African Languages, which explores the ongoing confluence between indigenous languages and European languages in African writing was published recently in 2023 by James Curry. Somehow, Professor Tiono manages to keep this extensive, busy creative and scholarly profile with administrative responsibilities at his university, where he is also the director of the Institute of African Studies. And he has also found time today to present to us his talk, Unbound Tongues, New Nigerian Poets, Politics, Disillusionment, and Hope in an Age of Japa. 
So please join me virtually to extend a very warm welcome to Professor, Professor Induka Otiono. Prof, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Um, and then I would like to thank um, ALA, the African Literature Association, for organizing this series. They've been quite um, exciting. And then um, I'd also like to thank Professor Simon Lewis um, for inviting me and for coordinating this series. And then, of course, to my sister, Professor Dorothy Odati Wellington, um, we have just said before the session started that it's so interesting how we can hide in plain sight, you know, and that you and I are in Canada. Um, I thank you for this um, very, um, very heartwarming introduction and for introducing me and for moderating this session. Distinguished colleagues, lovers of literature from across the world who have joined for this session, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Ekaro, Ekaleo, Ekenemono, uh, wherever you are, um, it's definitely a pleasure to have you join us. The title of my presentation, as has been indicated in the poster um, just um, a short while ago now, is Unbound Tongues, New Nigerian Poets, Politics, Disillusionment, and Hope in an Age of Jagma. I would like to particularly note that this presentation aptly falls into the World Poetry Day weekend. And at a time when we are wrapping up the publication of our new anthology of the new generation of Nigerian poets under 40, titled Unbound, an anthology of new Nigerian poets under 40. And it's been um, co-edited by myself and Darlington Chibwez Anononye, who only recently jackpot from Nigeria to the University of Nebraska. So you might immediately know that my title is partly inspired by the title of this anthology. Indeed, when I was invited to give this lecture, I plan to make the publication of Unbound to coincide with this lecture, to use the opportunity to unveil this unique new anthology, which addresses my topic frontally. So what I plan to do in this lecture is to unpack the key terms in my title, and then use this anthology to address the salient issues by sharing relevant aspects of the interaction written by Darlington and myself and draw examples from the text as well. So just before I unpack the, the loaded title, I would like to share the cover of this book just to give you a sense of um, what it looks like. And this is the very first time we're publicly sharing it. So I'm gonna share this. So this is it. This is the book. What it looks like. Um, this is the cover of the book. I'm going to move from that into the presentation proper. So while I just keep that, and yeah. So why looking at this? Um, looking at this book. So here are the keywords in the loaded title of my of my presentation. Unbound tongues, new Nigerian poets. So these are the so we have unbound tongues, we have new Nigerian poets, we have politics, we have disillusionment, and then there's also hope. So it's very interesting to see this juxtaposition of disillusionment and hope. And then there is that other one that has a foreign word to it, foreign in the sense that it's not English, but it's part of what has become Niger lingo, you know, which is contemporary Nigerian street language or street terms which is Jagma. Before proceeding to discussing how these terms are implicated in our anthology, I'd like to address these key terms briefly. What do I mean by unbound tongues? And then why unbound tongues? So by the idea of unbound tongues being to suggest that tongues were bound, you know, i.e. they are unable to speak, or that people may have been, you know, restricted in a certain kind of place, and so they are breaking the shackles and then having freedom. But the word bound, the root word bound has a certain kind of antecedent in Nigerian poetry that I would like to quickly call our attention to. And some of you might be familiar with the poem or may not, but I would recommend that you look it up, especially if you're interested in seeing how uh, we enter into uh, some kind of intertextual conversation, which is the hallmark of my writing. So in this, there's a gesture to a previous uh, work 
And then a previous poem that became popular, very popular in my generation, um, which would be, I think this would be like in the late 20th century. Now that sounds so far away. <laughs> um, so we may begin by recalling Olo Gibe's poem titled, I am bound to this land by blood. It used to be something of an anthem, you know, at the time, which was uh, in the military days when there was a high proclamation of uh, patriotism and of the sense of belonging to a country that one was bound to by blood. And in a sense of also saying, come rain, come shine, we're going to live and die there. So we move from that uh, sense of being unbound and of being bound to this land to see how that dislocation is now implicated in not only the title, but in the lecture that I'm giving today. The other problematic term is new Nigerian poets. The question one might ask is, who are the new Nigerian poets? It's a big question that I would not pretend to answer, except to use a controversial generational marker, you know, saying uh, first generation, second generation, third generation, and then now we're beginning to talk about fourth generation. Uh, and then by fourth generation in this context of my presentation of new Nigerian poets, knowing that new always is problematic because there are poets or there are writers who may just be starting out their career in, um, in, their, in the later years of their lives. They could even be 70, 80, and are beginning their careers in writing. And so the idea of newness has its own controversies, and I don't want to pretend that it does not exist. But for purposes of convenience of categorization, uh, we think about the fourth generation poets, and then these are poets under 40, as indicated by the title of anthology um, that I'm still showing the. However, the idea of Nigerian poetry is actually contested, or even the new idea of new Nigerian poetry. And I recently came across an article that I thought I would draw our attention to, to show how problematic the idea of newness in the context of my lecture can easily be. And so to make sure that I am flagging it myself before uh, the questions begin to come in to contest that. And this is an essay called, uh, titled, Is Contemporary Nigerian Poetry Nigerian? So it's only a question of whether it is Nigerian in the first instance. And it's written by Ernesto O. Ogunyemi. And I quote from this idea of Nigerian poetry because there are two things that are thinking about new Nigerian poetry. So we're dealing with generational issues. We're dealing also with the idea of what might be classified as Nigerian poetry. There might not be unanimity in the sense of what you consider Nigerian poetry, especially with the younger generation who are raising very tough and important questions. And so I read from this article, quote, Nigerian poetry does not, Nigerian poetry does not exist. Many of today's Nigerian poets are working within a tradition that is not ours, a tradition that is mainly American. Additionally, even if our poetry happens to be Nigerian in its character, it possesses a distinct manner of speech, a movement of language all our own. The horizon of Nigerian poetry, of Nigerian literature is greatly limited. To speak of Nigerian poetry would mean that there is already a wide variety of poetry types within our tradition. This is a contest and that we can easily think about Obiwali's The End of, uh, uh, the end of um, Literature or you know, some of these other questions about the language of African literature and so on and so forth, which some of us are familiar with. The other loaded word there is politics. This is a wide and wild world that we shall live as it is in its conventional sense of politics, which typically refers to governance, you know, for the most part, but more or less politics in our everyday or personal lives, which would include especially in the context of the presentation that I'm making this morning with regard to Unbound the Anthology and the new Nigerian writing, which would include gender politics, for example. Then the idea of disillusionment and hope. Will we take this together and consider it one of the push factors for immigration and the Jackma syndrome in an age of Jackma. So I have rolled the idea of age of Jackma together. So let us for a moment contextualize our understanding of the term Jabba by invoking a serious, albeit, albeit um, and also deadly funny piece by Tony Falola, the historian, uh, simply titled Jabba and syndicated in some um, online platforms. Especially for non-Nigerians, it's important that I clarify what we mean by Jabba. And I'm gonna do this from the lens of this article 
uh, published by Tony Palala um, in September 2022. And then the article begins by one word, flee. And then goes on to say, Japa does not mean to walk away. It is to flee from danger or a compromising situation. It means fleeing an abusive relationship, an extremely demanding situation, and life-threatening issues. And the king of the meanings, flee from Nigeria. Slangs like Japa are apt social linguals that capture the state and situations of society and how the people are faring. They give linguists and society the ability to understand the nation from where from mere conversations and expressions. Using the same word for different concepts signifies similarity of situation or property. And where fleeing is applicable, it means there is implied and immediate gravitation from discomfort to comfort. To put Nigeria on the negative end of Japa is a disturbing development that needs urgent attention from relevant quarters. And relevant quarters do respond. So, one of the things we have to look at the ways in relevant quarters have done is to begin the idea that the street, the first street guy to publicly proclaim his, his Japarization from Nigeria was Andrew in 1984, before the millennials and Generation Z, Japa, uh, or the Japa generation were born. Many Nigerians of that age would not forget that television campaign against immigration, which Andrew played by Enebeli Enebeloa, lamenting the reasons why he was checking out of Nigeria. Fast forward to 2021, about 30 years after, and Andrew returns, Andrew is reincarnates in a repackaged campaign. And I would love to share this one minute video. Um, just give me a moment while I get this video running. And what Andy does, got to stop sharing this other one and then share this one. Sorry, I hope I have my audio on. Can you hear the audio? Please, can you hear the audio? I'm not so sure that the audio is playing. Can somebody who omit themselves we, and let me know? We can't hear the audio, audio. Uh, Duca, no. Sorry, we can't hear the audio. Sorry, can you hear the audio? No, we cannot we hear the audio. We can't hear the audio. Okay, sorry. I think I would have to reshare it just to be sure that you get the audio. Sorry, just excuse me. Uh, okay, I think I would just keep that and see if I can return to it. There should be a place where I can click on the sound. Okay, well... Um, just a moment, please. Uh, sorry about that. I should. Okay, I'm just going to speak to the video. So we can just look at it. This message is brought to you, and then I'll speak to it. OK, so the message, you could see the final message on that uh, video. Oh, just a, please, just a moment. I have.
Just a moment, please. Okay, so in that video that I played, and I'll just speak to it very briefly. Sorry about uh, that audio issue. Um, so this video um, clearly sends exactly the same message, and I'm reading a post, you know, that was added to it by one of the viewers. This video clearly sends exactly the same message that the Andrew checking out information and circulated across all the existing TV stations in Nigeria from 1981 till 1990s. It is obviously a remake of the 1984 Andrew checking out information that was acted by late Sir Enebelier label who are blessed memories. The legend actor and movie producer Saint Obi, who is the one that he showed in the current reincarnation, had a first hand relationship with the late Enebel Uwa. Hence, he understands the script Andrew checking out from an unusual depth. And he knows perfectly what it takes to interpret it. Sharing the Andrew checking out experience is derived from an information. And then it was launched by the Nigerian National Orientation Agency. And then you saw who does this. This is another diaspora agency that is trying to um, campaign against immigration or Jack Byron, especially in the present contest. The information of the main character is referred to as Andrew, played by the then famous actor. He will re retort, slinging his traveling bag over his shoulder. No light, no water, man, I'm checking out. Then someone stretched his hand and grabbed Andrew. And the person said to Andrew, that's the old one that I'm talking about. Don't check out. This TV information was created to influence public perception towards immigration. Then, while the information is still airing, informed a line in Beno Mariohe's popular song, Nigeria Go Survive, in which he sings, Andrew, don't check out to Nigeria Go Survive. Now, to further amplify this sense of checking out and this kind of um, the ways in which it's been taken up thematically by contemporary Nigerian writers, and we are referring more to this um, uh, under 40, which is a new Nigerian poet that I'm focusing on, I'd like to sample a bit of our uh, introduction to draw attention to the text that we have. And rather than quoting from already existing texts, you know, that have dealt with this issue of either diaspora or of immigration, of exile. And there are quite a number of them among the younger generation of writers, as well as the older generation. But by bringing the idea of Andrew checking out, it is intended to say that the idea of Jakba is, is not new to contemporary Nigerian experience. It's just been repackaged under a new street language. It's new street lingo, Jakba. And to illustrate how the street continues to influence our lives and how it also interacts with literary production, um, say in this instance, poetry. So the generational debate in Nigerian poetry has been shaped by the interventions of such anthologies as Poets in Their Youth, 1988, edited by Uchinduka and Osita Dima Ike, makes so rest in peace. Um, and then Voices from the Fringe, 1988, edited by Harry Garuba, Gems Out of Africa, a Wake anthology, and then there's so many other anthologies, um, including um, 25 New Nigerian Poets, in two thousand, published in 2000, edited by Twain Adewale Gabriel. And then, of course, Camouflage that has been mentioned. And then there are several other anthologies that have also been published. And so the anthologization project in Nigerian poetry, you know, was aimed at that time dealing with successive, the themes focused on successive military regimes, you know, that had almost extinguished the poetic flair that inspired the first two anthologies. But Camouflage, probably at a time when the status of Nigerian literature as a leading light of modern African writing has already been asserted, captures the subtle manner in which contemporary Nigerian poets responded to the transcendental imposition of fear and silence by the military. Recently, the poet and editor, Adedayo Agaru, and then I want to say that some of the names I'm going to be mentioning here might sound so strange and new to a number of you, but I believe to the younger people who are in this um, listening in um, who are familiar with some of the emerging new voices in Nigerian poetry will know that some of these poets that I'm mentioning have already become some kind of celebrity within their own generation. So um, I would um, wanted to bring that out. So recently, the poet and editor, Dedayo Agaru, published Memento, an anthology of contemporary Nigerian poetry in 2020, which congregates the works of established and emerging as well as home-based and diaspora contemporary Nigerian poets 
connected by the Nigerian imagination. Like all the above collections, Unbound is such an agenda setting anthology. It zooms into the works of the emerging generation of Nigerian poets born in the late 20th century and early 21st century. The anthology showcases some of the most brilliant members of this new generation of Nigerian poets under the age of 40, most of whom launched their writing careers on social media. And so the Japa era also coincides with the social media era. And so many of these poets, you know, have expressed themselves first, you know, actually launched their careers on social media. So by new generation, we do not suggest that the, the poets you know, like Romeo Oriogun, Sadik Zukogi, Chisom Okafo, Benga Adioba, Chinua Ezenwa Ohetu, Razak Malik, and among others, are typically unknown poets. Far from it. Instead, we mean that despite their remarkable talent, exemplified by their well-received individual books and publication in reputable African and institutional magazines and journals, as well as the numerous literary prizes they have won, these poets remain largely uh, or remain relatively unknown um, in Nigeria outside of the social media space and the literary circles. And so the exclusive emergence of this generation as finalists for the 2022 edition of the Nigerian's most coveted literary prize, the Nigerian Prize for Literature, you know, have drew more attention to the spectacular uh, poetry of this generation. By selecting Swede Vershima Agema for his poem, for his collection, Memory and the Call of Water, Oriogun's Nomad, and Zukogi's Your Creep, my obla, my pibla, from a long list of eleven of poetry collections dominated by posts by poets of the older generation, the prize jury legitimized the literary merit of the works of the new generation of poets, while also enhancing their economic capital because that's a $100,000 prize. Um, the jury's decision affirms the notion that some works have more literary values than others and deserve more attention by readers. And that also is controversial, um, as we know with many literary prizes. And so the, the Unbound is inspired by understanding that anthologies are useful in establishing and sustaining canons of literature. So by curating the works of these youthful poets, as I attempt to also do by focusing attention on them in this lecture, we intend to draw critical attention to their literary merits. And then also, as I'm gonna do shortly, to the kind of sometimes taboo topics that they deal with within the Japa era. The anthology contains the works of Nigerian poets at home and in diaspora. There's also the presence of Trust Tonji, a Beninese who grew up in Nigeria and whose poetry is shaped largely by his Nigerian identity and experience. And quite often, when we talk about emigration, we do not think of internal migration within the continent. We are always looking at external, you know, from Africa to the, to the West, um, and more and less about what happens internally, you know, to think about the different diasporas within the continent. Hopefully, um, reading this would uh, provide a more robust experience than reading individual collections of the poets. We classify these poets belonging to the fourth generation of Nigerian poetry. We use the marker fourth generation to distinguish from the predecessors, despite Harry Garba's caveat that the term generation is still an ambiguous, unstable one because in some instances, it appears to refer to age and in others to the time of first appearance of the post of the poet in the domain. Since the poems are written by poets, are written by poets not older than 40 years, whose poetic inspiration derives from similar experiences of the Nigerian condition and globalization. The, this, um, the poets we are discussing here adheres to Pius Adesami and Chris Dunton's suggestion that a new generation of poets must, quote, fall within a loosely determined age bracket or are published within a loosely defined time frame, And I'm just going to skip the issues of, of, of um, that to deal with the poems itself, to see the kind of ideas that they deal with, you know, and how the idea of diaspora and the ideas of, of engagement, you know, with uh, disillusionment, you know, also plays out. So the poems, 
you know, organized around four parts, collective, individual visions, and subthemes. The first part, Reflections, contains such points like Oryogun's The Register of Disappearance, Zukogi's Like My Dreams Wearing Made of Glass, Elisha Oluyemi's A Continuum of Wretch, and John Chizoba Vincent's Asylum Thoughts, in which, and I'm going to just use this as an example, in which the wandering self is sublimated with a care that renews the possibility of rest even when the vision of home is sometimes blurry and other times ghastly. The closing poem, When a Boy Left His Town Through His Mother's Eyes by Vincent, accounts for the trauma that makes migration inevitable, that makes Japa inevitable. Complete with its baggage of exilic consciousness, the poem follows the journey of a boy who left his town through the eyes of his mother in pursuit of the means to pay homage to his father's gray hairs. As though it is not depressing enough that the poem persona, like most young Nigerians, has to leave his home in order to fulfill his responsibility and dreams um, to his family and to himself, he is not alone in this predicament. He says to himself, and I quote, I am not the only soul captured with blazing lights. I am not the only soul who chose the way of our leaders. End of quote. It is sad to realize that the boy and the unnamed people are victims of lies. Sadder to, to note that those lies were peddled by their leaders, some of whom are their parents. So Vincent depicts migration as a response to the betrayal of the patriotic creed of young people, of citizens by the ruling class. And then there are other poems in the session called Confessions. And I want to note that they are already emerging critique of the writing of um, of poets of this generation about the focus on self, the interiority. And then, you know, sometimes the, 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 the overemphasis on personal traumas. And then this session on confessions, you know, exactly deals with that. And I'm not going to go into all details um, to discuss that. But I want to, for a moment, you know, move into some aspect of these confessions that also has uh, been part of the the gender politics, the sexual politics that are already playing out in some of the in contemporary African literature. For instance, vulnerability superimposes the densely lyrical confessions in Elias Udo, Udo Ochi's poem Papercraft. Also, poets like Goodness, Olari Waju Ayola, in Fatherhood, Chisom Okafo, in Stranglehold, among others, contemplate on the private and the public experience that illuminates you know, parts of the Nigerian situation, even as their craft reaches towards the assemblage of the human condition. So this section also includes poems of queer orientation. In quote, a boy holds his body like fuel. And Tuana Fe um, Ayosujumi Akinsoya describes the embattled lives of queer people living in Nigeria with a tongue of fire and the imagery of ash. And I quote, a boy holds his body like fuel in a country where death spreads out like a prayer mat. When his people kneel to pray, it is to curse. When they roll up their mats to love, they twine the vines of hate in the young. Okwesili, in a less assertive but emotionally wrenching manner, takes the religious and the moral image of the fire with which society burns queer people to its funeral end in, and I quote, but who will tell his mother? And I like to read this um, since I'm not reading any more poems um, to illustrate. I know what the people here say of boys like me. I do not look back, but who will tell his mother? Think Emeka, David, and Olawale. Boys who put their lips to other boys and became a judge. Their sin to love, verb to be, God defined in the simplest form. End of quote and um, of that excerpt. This is the protest poem addressing the criminalization of queer bodies is quiet, not loud, sad, but not yelling. The persona fights back with language, with emotions, with narratives. There are many placards and verbal missiles. As most protest poems are wont to, it doesn't have them. Just a lone resilient voice naming the immolation of boys like him, rewriting the manifesto of homophobia in a language that is brittle but unbreakable. And there are many other poems that also deal with some of these topics. 
And among them is the omniscient voice in the poem, um, in Fumi Gaji's poem in this anthology, um, which has, you know, a pathos when they search for an exit road and seek deliverance of the decay that is Nigeria. Fumi Gaji intensifies the generational effort to hold Nigeria accountable for its crimes by calling the erring nation its proper name, Father. The omniscient voice in this poem speaks directly to the children of the father, reminding them of their father's acts of paternal betrayal and violence. Gadget's your father builds you a wing, renders the abiding struggle between Nigeria and its citizens with images that pierce the psychology of readers as they realize the shocking similarity between their social condition and the private experience of the individual whom the poem addresses. This progress of the subject of the poem nipped in the board by an insecure and abusive father who, although wishes his child to fly, is afraid that a child may fly, and I quote, so he builds wings of wax, then takes fire to them. Even Jesus Christ would have been shocked by aridity or feeling of his father. For here is one man so callous he is capable of giving his child stone instead of bread to quench their hunger. But what is more scandalous is that his father in his cruelty resembles the leaders of Nigeria whose viciousness targets the Nigerian people. Other poems like Razak Malik's Flowers, Swed Verishima's Agema's Twinkle Twinkle Wrinkled Star, uh, Covenant Chimso's Benjamin's My Body Is No Longer Here, and Chibweze Anthony Ukwama's War Starts are unanimous in their portrayal of the country as a crime scene. And we witness this in many of these other po um, uh, poems, you know, written by this generation. Thematically, these poems give voice to a generation that occasionally been culturally, socially, or politically written off. They, they choose to tell their stories, declaring, quote, we are here, our norms and values are valid. The target audience for this collection of poems is anyone, regardless of geographical location and social identity or stratum, who is interested in Nigerian lives and experiences. And so the common theme is a reticence, as all the poems, like prisms, break the human race into the mirror colors, shifting in quick succession. And if we'll have to go beyond this anthology, the idea of Jack Bauer, and then to return to the title of our, of our presentation, again, so that we can look at all those words, Unbound Tongues, New Nigerian Poets, Politics, Disillusionment, and Hope in an Age of Jack Bauer. Why has it become so that the increasing emphasis, you know, for something we have said, for example, that Andrew, the idea, Andrew's checking out, was already 30 years old, you know, in regard to the TV information. And then we have a repackaged one by, by the diaspora, um, by the diaspora organization in Nigeria, and also trying to discourage that. But increasingly, uh, the idea of Jabba of immigration has become so close to the heart that this has defined every part of street life in Nigeria. That you can hardly ever come across uh, several social media posts that are not going to talk about Jabba. Jabba has become one of the most commonly used terms in Nigerian streets and then in conversations. This is also reflected increasingly in the writing and then the writing of these new Nigerian poets who themselves have become victims as it were and then especially in the poem by Gaji that deals with the disappointments, as it were, of the preceding generation, you know, more or less the kind of betrayal, as it were, and how these young people begin to find ways of seeking exit, you know, from the conditions that are so overpowering. The Nigerian poetry, contemporary Nigerian poetry has dealt with, you know, continues to focus on this. But I would like to add as I'm closing that this is not just only about contemporary Nigerian poetry in regards to this generation, but that, you know, older generation, if I might use that word, advisedly have also dealt with this and the idea of migration. I do this in my own poetry. Uh, this place, you know, does this extensively. And some critics have talked about the sense of memoir poetics, you know, where increasingly the poets, the poetry is not just only public, but also intensely private. Uh, but beyond all of that, what is most important to note is that um, poets, um, or the second heading generation, for example, if you think about uh, when it no longer matters where you live, uh, by Tanure or Jaide, 
have also begun to deal with, you know, the issues of migration. Migration is an old topic, but it's interesting to note that the next of this series has to do with new African diasporas. And scholars like Isidok Bebo had also uh, uh, focused on the idea of the new African diaspora. So what is the implication of a new diaspora, especially in including uh, Generation Z and, um, and millennials? who are increasingly seeking exit as a way of confronting the kind of debilitating conditions they live with with relation to what might be classified as the older, uh, the old African diaspora. And I think these are questions that I believe that we can take up even further in relation to um, contemporary Nigerian poetry and how these tongues have been unbroken. Not only unbroken, but do not consider any topic taboo and are willing to deal with the the, the most difficult issues and questions of politics, of disillusionment, while scratching around to see whatever threads of hope they can hang on to. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. And, and, and I have to say, that we are very, very happy and privileged to have you with us today. And to be among uh, the first few to hear about the forthcoming um, new anthology. And while we wait, I, I can't see the, the, the comments yet, but while we wait for um, attendees to bring forward their questions, I want to take the opportunity to ask you um, a couple of questions. I have so many I am trying to um, uh, select, um, but I think I I'd like to start from um, a question related to your title, and uh, which is quite significant. You began by pointing out the juxtaposition of disillusionment and hope in this age of Jakpa. And I, I want you, um, I wonder if you, you we, we have heard some of the, um, uh, the themes of, of, of the poems that are in that anthology and and how they express the uh, discontent um, with uh, the current context. I wonder if you could expand a bit on the dimension of hope in the contributions in your anthology. Okay, so um, the question of hope, as we, as some of us will know, I, I, when I teach my creative writing workshop, I begin, especially at the first, at the, at the junior level, I ask the students the question, what inspires you to write, sadness or joy? You know, because I find the idea of what inspires us to write to also be synonymous sometimes to the kind of poetry that we write. You know, whether in terms, whether we're writing about happy poems or writing about about sad poems. And it was uh, Eskia Nafalele, the South African poet, you know, that uh, was quoted as uh, having said that until the South African poets, the Black South African poets, finish writing about blood, they will not write about, about roses. You know, something to that, I'm just paraphrasing that. So in other words, there is always that choice to make between that bitterness, as it were, I'm trying to scrape some elements of joy in it. I have, and then there are so many analyses of some African writing, and then sometimes Latin American writing, you know, say of Pablo Neruda, um, where even an, an attempt to write about love dissolves into um, some kind of bitter uh, metaphor about love for a country and its betrayal. And then so it just looks like that writing about love fails and then you're getting into more serious thing. So with this generation, a great deal of this poetry is somber. And I think pretty much like the, like the older generation. And then also the context in which African um, poetry emerged and then Nigerian poetry, um, which began, uh, and I mean modern Nigerian poetry, we're not talking about orality, oral, oral tradition, uh, where you had Azikiwe, Nambi Azikiwe, Dennis Osadebe, some of these earlier poets, Osengo, who began to write, who wrote poetry on the basis of, um, of struggle, you know, where literature was not just one of aesthetics, but one of protest. And so that tradition of protest literature has evolved. And in more recent times, almost to a level of disillusionment. And this disillusionment has ignited a wave, a new wave as it were. So by using the idea of wave, then it just means that I am not, 
um, <laughs> I'm not imagining, as some of the millennials might think, that Jackpot is a new phenomenon. Uh, so it's a new wave that is also ignited by an extreme sense of disillusionment, of, 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 and then also bordering on hopelessness. And how they navigate this becomes a very interesting idea. Yesterday, um, I just read a post on Facebook by one of the popular um, Nigerian scholars and um, academics in the United States, you know, um, Moses Ochuno, where he revisits uh, a theory of nostalgia that has been proposed by a friend and a colleague of ours at the University of Ibadan. By nostalgia, he is uh, refocusing attention not only to the diaspora um, on uh, Africans in the diaspora and what happens with them as a great other writing tends to do. And the focus is, but you know, a reversal of what happens to the people who have been left behind and how they deal with immigration and the absences of family and friends due to Jabba. And I think these are very worthy conversations to do because we can be thinking about hope just in terms of the diaspora of citizens who have to use that first uh, term in um, Twin Falola's uh, article on Japa, you know, flee, you know, um, as, as an escape. You know, the idea of escape, you know, has, is a recurrent trope in literature, um, especially within contexts of adversity, where escape. And then um, that reminds me, I would like to uh, refer to, to quote the lines of Dambuzo Maracheras, The House of Hunger. That book was a very popular within my generation as we well, emerging in the 1980s at the University of Ibadan from school. Uh, the book was almost like a Bible that begins with, I got my things and left. And then it has those opening lines that are so visceral, you know, in terms of Dambuzo Maracheras' um, um, exhaustion, you know, with his, with his, uh, with his life and, the, and, the, and Zimbabwe at the time that he fled into exile. And those lines remain for me um, one of the most powerful lines in any fiction in African writing. You know, just those lines, I got my things and left. And so I, the question you ask is very germane about hope because indeed um, hope looks like the major reason why we live. There's a line that I quote from um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, that's one of my favorite quotes. Um, in No One Writes to the Colonel, the novel. And there has been this conversation between the the colonel and his wife. And, you know, the woman says at some point that you can't eat hope because the colonel had been going to the post office to look for his retirement benefits for, I, I can't remember the number, but for several years and it just wasn't coming. And he was about giving up hope and all of that. And so, um, or the woman was, so the woman says, it goes to the extent that they started cooking stones to give impression to neighbors that things were still going. And so out of frustration, and then she says, you can't eat hope. And the choir responded, you know, you can't eat hope, but hope sustains us or something like that. Um, so it's a very interesting question. It's something that we can have very extensive discussion about how dark, you know, uh, these poems might be and what glimmers of hope exist, you know, within the poetry of this generation of poets. Thank you so much uh, for the generous response. And I, I hope we continue to talk about this. Simon, are there any questions um, from attendees, please? Yeah, I put one in the in the chat from uh, Joya. OK. Um, yes. OK, so um, Joya, thanks you uh, for the talk. Um, can you describe um, what publishing venues these young poets use? Um, do they publish mostly online or in more mainstream venues? Thank you for so, that question, Joya. That's, that's, a, that's a very, very, very important question. Because um, during my presentation, I talked about many of these poets actually arriving on the scene via social media. You know, sometimes through small posts on social media. And then they have also become so adept at creating literary magazines. But there are important factors that have influenced the publishing. And this includes the, 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 the effect of the MFA programs in the United States. It has become a pathway for many of these writers. Um, some of the writers from Nigeria who have, and not only Nigeria, I think, from the continent, um, and, I want, and I don't want to mention specific names, who have hit the limelight, have come through that pathway, the MFA pathway. 
uh, that platform has become so significant for the emergence of new Nigerian poets and new Nigerian writers generally. So whereas we could think about an older generation in fiction, not just older generation, but at least the, the preceding generation, uh, maybe some of the writers who have been described as third generation. So I would think about novels that deal with diaspora and with immigration, like uh, Chika Unigwe's um, On Black Sister Street, you know, and many other novels uh, that deal with it. So it's been more popular in fiction. Uh, but these young people, and that also represents the critique of the work of some of these writers of writing or pandering to American audience and American prizes, because there has been a pathway through the MFA programs. Uh, that has allowed them to also emerge. And uh, some of you who might be familiar with the MFA programs would recognize that in some cases, uh, these writers also launched their careers from their MFA work, you know, uh, that enabled them uh, to move ahead to write. And so within that structure, it also meant that uh, whether it's the Iowa Writers Program, for example, and many other fellowships, so not only the MFA, but also international fellowships, and their retreats and all of those kind of opportunities are provided. The other is the literary prizes, you know, um, and then a major one that has also been a catalyst for these writers is the African Poetry Fund. I hope I get it right, you know, um, with Dawes and them um, and them um, at uh, University of Nebraska, you know, where they have published these chat book boxes, and some of these writers emerged from that. Some of them that have gained you know, more higher reputation, you know, emerge from that. And it's important to recognize this. However, as articles um, by some Nigerian scholars, including Uche Mezurike, um, that have done, um, there has been emphasis on the idea of publishing, uh, which remains an African problem. We do know about the short lifespan of some um, great publishing outlets, you know, in the, country, in the continent where they emerge and how that became difficult, even more so within the context of dictatorship in Africa, uh, in Nigeria, in, in this particular context, where writing in the 60s, literary production shifted to the pages of the newspapers. And I was fortunate and privileged to have played a role with the Post Express Literary Supplement that became a major platform because uh, magazines, uh, journals, and all of that have been squeezed uh, due to poor funding and other resources. So now there is also that collection, that, that collective, as it were. Uh, this has produced some collective of writing by this younger generation who find these outlets. And there are a rash of literary magazines online. Uh, Brittle Paper has played a significant role as well. Um, Africanwriting.com. So it's mainly online that this has happened. But because they have also begun to establish a reputation through online platforms, then some traditional presses have also begun to pay attention, whether it's locally or international. Narrative landscape in Lagos, for example, who are Chimamanda Adichie's uh, Nigerian publishers, and that publishes Box of Books, and then also publishes um, publishes uh, the pres former president of Lucia Gomez Basanjo, you know, and others, and then Maso Books. So they are emerging new new publishers as well that are published, you know, run by younger people who are also very interested in the works of these younger people and are investing in it through different kinds of arrangements. That includes having an international edition and a local edition because of the politics of knowledge production and of book circulation, whereby many of the books published here, and as academics, sometimes we publish books that are, that are sold for 200 and something dollars. And you're like, who's gonna buy that? the target libraries. And so that kind of tragedy of watching ourselves, even as academics, published in spaces that are not available to the people uh, who should be consuming that. The kind of politics that are bred, you know, for example, a parallel establishment of African Studies Association of Africa, you know, as, as, a, as a, not a counterpoint, but also as a juxtaposition to the African Studies I don't want to say that, maybe, or the Western world. Um, and that's not what I mean, of course. I'm using that, you know, for sort of convenience. So, Joya, you're very right. You know, uh, the young poets, they do publish mostly online, but they are also gradually getting into mainstream. Thank you so much. And um, I have a question here from uh, Simon. This is from you. Um, 
Simon is um, says he's always interested in the prioritization of fiction over poetry by literary scholars. Um, and do you, he's asking, do you have any opinion on that? Do these poets get sufficient attention? Oh, wow. This is a great question as well. So I'm going to answer Simon's question by sharing um, a sneak preview of Neo Shundari's blog for Unbound. And he talks about the book, and I won't say the full thing about it says about the book. I'm just going to use a phrase that speaks to Simon's question. And it says Nigerians most Nigerians' favorite genre, literary genre, is poetry. And uh, the writer of uh, the first generation writer, female writer, um, Madame Mebel Shegum, is reputed to have said those days when we're back in the bottom, that if you threw a stone in the universe of the bottom, it was likely to land on a poet. And so here we are at the level of international publishing or at the level of publishing where fiction is a preferred genre for a variety of reasons. But this has not deterred these poets from practicing poetry as a favorite genre. And there are a number of literary spaces where this is the case. So um, they, you can say that in terms of global publishing and global presses, the emphasis has remained on fiction for reasons for which we can debate, but that in terms of the consumption of poetry, and of the popularity of genre, poetry has also remained you know, strong um, within the Nigerian literary space. And there are a variety of avenues through which this is being published. There are more, in fact, there's also spoken word, you know, poetry, there are word slams happening in, there are poetry reading sessions, more than you can think of any literary genre. Um, it's modern fiction, modern, um, modern, um, 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 drama or any of this. So poetry remains, you know, very popular. Although the big presses might not be publishing this collection of poems, um, they are big, they also continue to to to, to flourish. Uh, Simon, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to go to a question from um, Jerome. Um, yes, Jerome writing from Perth. Um, Jerome says that at the heart of the disillusionment that the younger poets speak to is the question of nationhood. And he says that Ghana is currently going through her own Jakpa moment. What does disillusionment and its representation in recent poems say about the nation state in West Africa? Wow. <laughs> I think this is, a, this is a big question that requires, you know, almost another lecture. I, I tried in my presentation to keep it short, not to get into that extensive political discourse about the state of anomie uh, and about the political state across many African states, you know, that has, um, as it were, created this push factor um, for many of these people. So can you please, um, um, to think about Disillusionment and East representation, um, say about the nation state. And I think I have dealt with this, you know, extensively in my presentation. Uh, but I, I just thought if I want to extend that, I can go into further illustration. So a number of the points, for example, that I haven't uh, discussed yet, deal with this, with these images. You know, they deal with the images of collapse. They deal with the images of, of total disappointment, of rot. You know, in um, in this in these forms, they deal with images of death, and I can um, check that uh, collection and and uh, demonstrate with actual examples. And then sometimes they just also deal with images of asphyxiation. You know, where is like strangulation, where the individual is strangled. So what does it say if you think about the Nigerian situation? For example, Nigeria is about the current. Um, um, President and the current electoral cycle in Nigeria is just going to be about one year old in May, May 29. And the last election was highly contested, as it were, you know, um, with the with the obedience 
and um, and and the other parties and the young people routine. And prior to this has been, you know, the NSAS protests, you know, which were young people taking to the streets to protest uh, first the idea of um, a, a, a police unit that was given to a whole lot of extrajudicial practices that affected young people. Um, and so if it has, it has precipitated the NSAS riots, but more recently is also the idea that uh, the political process has let the people down. You can see the image of the family, of the father, who is supposed to be protective, that I read in Fumigaji's poem, uh, which I found very telling. There are others in this collection about that disappointment. So we're dealing with a generation who, in some cases, consider their fathers and their, their fathers mainly, which is interesting, not their mothers, you know, and that's a different dynamic because also of patriarchy and the dominance in governance in Africa, you know, of their father's disappointment um, in terms of their own hopes and aspirations. So it does point to the rot, unfortunately. It just points, the, the saddest part of it, as a matter of fact, is not only the rot or disillusionment, but also a near state of hopelessness. So it's not just about stasis, it's about a situation that is, that is negative, you know, that is negative. And this is implicated in Nigeria, for example, with the free fall of the Nigerian currency in more recent, um, in more recent months, especially. And this has impacted the lives of everyday people, you know, in terms of their capacity. And in, there's galloping inflation. We can go to all of these physical indicators and you'll find many Nigerians, there are so many um, shots, you know, these days, um, content creators that are, for want of anything else to do, process these very terrible experiences through humor. You know, uh, they try to produce content that allows them um, to deal with the traumas of, 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 uh, of, extreme, of extreme poverty. You know, where people go to the market in the morning, and they buy an item for 10 naira, for example, and they return in the evening and it's like 40 or 50 naira. And that is coupled with a situation where there are no jobs. Uh, the unemployment rate is not even being calculated and put on national conversations. But many families, including mine, have family members who have never worked for close to 10 years after graduation, have never found a job. And this considers this youth army, or what some people have called a youth bomb. We are not so sure how this is going to be resolved in the light of the continuing underperformance and tragic performance, as a matter of fact, of the of the of the of the political rulers, as some people prefer to call them, I included, than saying political leaders. So um, it does speak very, very poorly about the ideal representation. The saddest part of it is that electoral systems have not proven to be that free and fair, and political participation has also does not seem to have really extend that this can, that people, everyday people can bring about a change, the kind of change that they wish for. And these conversations remain, and our writing and our poetry, um, and the young people will continue to process this, either by voting with their feet and jabbering, or through the poetry, or engaging sometimes in subversive acquiescence, you know, um, in different kinds of ways that include the 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 the, the spate of kidnappings and other vices in Nigeria and in some of these other African countries. We can hear you, Dorothy. Thank thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, your generous response. Um, we are running out of time. I know there uh, the are a lot more people who have questions, but we'll take um, two more and, and wrap up. So first of all, we'll go to um, uh, another question from Joya, who says, uh, could you please give some examples of specific images or symbols these poets use within the larger theme of checking out? Okay, so um, Joya, to answer your question, I'm going to share not images from our collection because indeed there's so many of them and I've tried to use some of them. I'm going to share a book that fits into this other um, American 
um, role in the emergence of this new generation. And then just give me a moment. I'm going to share um, this book. Let me see if I could find it. Yes. Okay. So, Joya, look at the title of this work, Exodus. And this is a book by one of the emerging voices, Renga Adioba, with a foreword by Kwame Dawis. I have specifically chosen this to draw attention to the role of Kwame Dawis and the University of Nebraska um, Press and the Poetry Fund. And then look at this again. The African Poetry Book Series has been made possible through the generous, uh, generosity of philanthropies, and this is at the Library of Congress. So this is a series, and there are others in that series. So if we take this, and there's also Nomad, and there are, those images include images we've talked about. The major images you know, um, include water, um, the idea of movement, you know, of migration. And then also of disappointment. Sometimes, as I have shown, the images could also be one of, of love, you know, not, not ametry, uh, but different kinds of love in its most complicated um, um, treasure, in its most complicated form, as it were. Um, so, and then I can show other examples in some of those poems, um, they're there, you know, um, uh, dealing with, death you know as it were uh you're going to find poems like epitaph you know like in this the middle passage all of these sometimes repurposing older motifs as it were older images of of emigration of the middle passage of exile and repurposing them and then in many cases as i have said you know interiorizing them as ways of processing the trauma so some of them are images of trauma um, in the section of the anthology, that is Confessions. Um, I don't have the PDF open that allows me to click uh, to, to click on the links to specific poems to just illustrate the point I'm making. But especially the section on Confessions, you know, deals with some of these images. They are images of personal disappointment, of traumas that have been suffered, you know, through um, experiences in the post-colonial condition that are being reimagined. Um, and being processed. On one of those poems um, that is not included in this collection, but somewhere, is one of, of dinner. We're at a dinner table. What is served is not food, but grief. It's sadness. That's what a poet can imagine. As a family, a family dinner that's supposed to be something of joy degenerates to one of pain and of disappointment. Um, so I think um, that's what I can say for now. And then um, I can discuss a whole lot more about this um, outside of this forum. Thank you so much. And uh, we take the last uh, question um, signed by PJ Splon, um, uh, who says, thank you for that engaging presentation. I am thinking of the distinction between unbound tongues and untied tongues particularly in reference to Marlon Riggs' 90s documentary, Tongues Untied. An untied tongue is by definition an, an, an unbound tongue, but is an, an, but is an unbound tongue one that had been untied? What a tongue twister. I hope I, I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> you just took those words out of my mouth. I was saying that, well, um, you're, you're dealing with the tongue twister is already a reflection of how complicated the question is and the and the untying that I'm expected to do also does. So, um, yeah, it's so easy to think that they're synonyms, but the inflections in terms of meaning may just differ because untying looks very literal. You know, when you're untying something, you know, you're untying, untying the tongue. It looks, it looks, it has a more literal interpretation. Whereas unbounding the tongue seems to have, in my view, or in our view, a more poetic rendition. So um, you just look at the, the, the complexion of the, of the terms. And I really appreciate your drawing my attention to Myron Riggs' 90s documentary, which I am not familiar with and which I am definitely going to check out and see ways in which that also enables us to properly contextualize and understand 
uh, the kind of difference that we set out to do. Why on bound tongue in terms of my title? But note that this is only speaking about the title of my talk. That is not a title of the book. The title of the book, as I had said, is Unbound. And then it has a subtitle, An Anthology of New Nigerian Poets Under 40. So the Unbound Tongues is what I have associated with the title of my work as a way of dealing with the issues of being unbound. Um, that's very complex, you know, because are they, you can ask the question, are the tongues really unbound? In what ways are the tongues unbound? In what ways might we say that there is nothing new that is actually being said, but repurposing of old experiences that, for example, poor leadership has been a recurrent decimal of post-colonial African politics and post-colonial African life in many countries. And what's happening that is totally new, that is different in the Nigerian context from the military years, of it, for example. Uh, you might begin to make comparisons to talk about uh, the free space that at least you could say whatever you like and don't easily disappear or be arrested, you know, the gulag as it were. And so um, it could be used synonymously as it were, but the very important idea is that in speaking about unbound tongues, we are thinking about the whole lot of psychological experiences that are associated with the idea of tongue and of expression. And this would include, for example, how a queer body can write a poem or express themselves in a way that could lead to death. So yet we operate in a democracy where some of these ideas of freedom are also, um, as it were, uh, proclaimed and then where it's complicated. We can also think in terms of the consequences, you know, uh, within institutions uh, where people, we have seen that happen, for example, in the United States and different parts of the world in the context of the war in the Middle East, where unbinding your tongue or untying your tongue to speak your own truth becomes so consequential that it is possible that it could, you know, lead sometimes to the end of your career. Uh, we can easily think of what happened at Harvard, you know, regard to the first female president and the way she, she exited. And then in many other contexts, so yes, thanks for bringing this out to me. I would like to see uh, the documentary um, to be able to fully deal with the contours or the difference in the specific context of Marion Marlon Riggs's 90s documentary that you have said. I have just tried to deal with the definition from um, a general perspective of someone who had the option, which is the natural option of saying untied tongue. Uh, but being from the poetic angle, I chose not to use untying the tongue, but unbounding the tongue, because that also connects the talk, as it were, um, to this um, new anthology. Thank you so much. I had said that that was going to be our last question, but um, <laughs> if you allow me, I will add one more from Ngong Jenjuo in Cameroon, um, who, uh, who says, in Cameroon, with the ongoing uh, war in the two English-speaking parts of the country, the unbound tongues remain tied. Mm. Here there is censorship in full armor. How do we experience the Japa moment? Wow. <laughs> These are very great questions and I really appreciate them. Um... English-speaking parts of the country, the unbound tongues remain tied. So censorship is a crazy part of our experience in different parts of the world. And there are different kinds of censorship. You know, the most glaring, some people will prefer situations of war or will clearly say in terms of defining censorship that is in your face, that you know that you are forbidden from this because these are the immediate consequences. But in some places where there is a semblance of some kind of democracy, where censorship operates in a more, a more hideous way and the indirect way, where individuals' um, sense of censorship is the most vicious because you are thinking of, I don't want to just say what I think about this specific situation because I know what this could be or what this could lead to. And I can think not only of some African countries, I can think of some other African countries where you have musicians 
who have stood for elections and who were who were who were either arrested or made to flee, you know, in a different kind of so the freedom of expression um is a very complicated one. Um, it was a great Afrobeat king, Fela Nikola Bokuti, who told us a story then when I was a journalist in one of his world camp, world press conferences. He had just come back then after his imprisonment and he had gone to the United States on tour and then had come back. And he remembers a particular experience, you know, where he said he exceeded his time allotted for him to play because the audience was asking for more, you know, and, you know, when they asked for an encore and, you know, being a very revolutionary um, artist himself, and then he put, he gave them more. He thought they really loved it. And that he was surprised that he was penalized afterwards when they were paying it because they had encroached on some other performance time. And so when he went on stage in some of the, in his next concert, and they were going to say, this is America, land of freedom, but freedom is expensive. And so the point that you make is very heartbreaking. I was in the Cameroon. I was in Cameroon um, over the Christmas break as part of our Queen Elizabeth Advanced Scholars Project, where we have two scholars from Cameroon. And it hit me so much about when I spoke to people um, in harsh tones, I had some, you know, very disturbing details about um, this country and um, about the experiences of the English speaking people, the Ambazonia, Ambazan, um, how they call it again, Ambazonians or something like that, and how the struggle for self-determination continues there. In most political contexts where there's struggle for self-determination, Nigeria has gone through that phase. And um, I am from Delta State, from the, the, the Niger Delta part of uh, Nigeria that is west of the Niger, that uh, Igbo's west of the Niger. And some may have heard about the massacres and all of that. And you know, the IPOB and all of those kind of struggles, sometimes where it becomes very complicated about which part of the struggle you would, you would have to lean to. So yes, um, um, tongues will not always be untied. But the point remains, as this poet demonstrates, that there has to be a defiance. And I did say in my presentation about how they, how they refuse to be muzzled. Their predecessors, even against the colonialists, you know, refuse to be muzzled. Um, the African poets, modern African poets, who began on the basis of protest, you know, African literature protest and conflict. Um, there is a, a, a reincarnation of it in a different way, except that in the current circumstances, it would appear that a generation that is so disempowered, sometimes so impoverished, appear not to be so primed to fight back. But the examples of Ensa's uh, protest and the different uh, mobilization by young people show that the they, that, that the jury is still out on these situations, um, whether it's in the Cameroon, in Nigeria, in DRC, or anywhere else in the continent. Thank you so much. I I, I appreciate it. I I believe I'm speaking on behalf of all um, colleagues uh, and friends in attendance. Um, that it has been a very enjoyable morning um, for us, having you here to speak to us about um, your forthcoming anthology, Unbound. The title itself, Unbound, is a symbol of hope. It is. It also gives us hope that in spite of all the challenges, some of which have been spoken about this morning, you are bringing out this anthology. It gives us hope that there are young people in Nigeria and in the diaspora who are still speaking out, who are still writing, who are still singing um, um, their, their lives and their experiences. And we look forward to having Unbound in our hands. I would like to hand over now to Simon uh, for any concluding words. Thank you so much, uh, Dorothy, for the very eloquent closing. And uh, to you, uh, Professor Otiono, for a, a wonderful presentation. Um, we had lots of uh, commendations in the in the chat, people talking about beautiful presentation, great presentation. Uh, somebody saying, as we say in Nigeria, you did not disappoint, uh, which I presume you will find uh, sufficiently uh, praiseworthy. <laughs> it's wonderful use of understatement there. 
Uh, I'm particularly grateful to you for um, the shout outs to Kwame Dawes and that amazing work that he's doing uh, with that book publishing process out of, of all places, uh, Nebraska. Uh, that seems extraordinary that Nebraska should become so important in the history of, of African poetry publishing, but he's, he's doing wonderful work over there. So uh, kudos to him and kudos to you for this uh, absolutely terrific talk. I know there were some more questions in the chat. Um, we have, I will remind the viewers who've been with us, we had viewers from Czech Republic, we had folks from Cameroon, from Nigeria, from Australia, uh, and from all over uh, the US, as well as you two guys up in Canada. So this was a, a truly worldwide experience of um, Japa, maybe, uh, <laughs> in the audience. Um, I know that those topics are going to be coming up at the ALA conference in May. And I'd like to remind folks uh, online, if you haven't already done so, the um, deadline for early bird registration for the ALA conference is actually tomorrow, March the 24th. So if you want to get the slightly reduced um, registration fee, uh, please do register uh, by tomorrow. And then finally, uh, just to wrap up, uh, the fifth and final lecture in the ALA lecture series for 2023-2024 will take place on April the 20th, the same channel, the same time, um, and actually picking up in many ways on uh, this topic, dealing with diaspora, uh, not solely focused on, on poetry any longer, but Tanure Ojaide is one of the speakers, as is uh, Lokungaka Nosambe. Um, they have jointly edited a book on um, the diaspora uh, African literature, which should be coming out about that time. So um, again, thank you very much indeed, Professor Otiono. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Odarty Wellington. Thank you to Lexi for the backroom assistance here with the technology. And thank you to everybody uh, in the audience, wherever you are in the world. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, if it still is. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Um, and we'll see you in April. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye.